Thank you. Hi, everyone. So I'm Miranda. I'm a researcher and a pre-doc, you could say, at University of Chicago. Uh, my advisor, Blazer, he presented here a few years ago, and he wanted to be here, but he had to do the thing that professors do, which is teach. Um, so this is my first time at PasswordsCon, and I'm, a, I would say, a member of the usable security and privacy research field. And so a lot of the work I do is on user research, which might be a little different than some of the other presentations you've seen today. Um, but this is a talk about passwords, and so I wanted a classic introduction, and I settled with the password is dead. Um, refer to Paris t-shirt right now. This was Bill Gates in 2004. Um, but before you fall asleep, don't worry, I'm not giving a monologue about whether or not the password is going to stick around. I just want to draw, uh, draw your attention to the full context of what Bill really said in 2004, when he still had brown hair. Um, so if we break this statement down, he began with the classic that uh, past people are going to rely less and less on passwords, we know that this is not true. Uh, password is not dead yet. Um, and at the end, he said that uh, passwords are not really going to meet the challenge. They're not that great for securing things that need to be secure. And so we know that this part is definitely true. Uh, but in the middle, just sandwiched right in there, he said a decade and a half ago that people use the same password on different systems. And he made this very astute observation a long time ago. And let's give this some context. So for an extremely abbreviated history of password usability, um, some, at, the, at the beginning there was 1985, NIST uh, publishes the password usage guide. This was 1985. And there's a small, very small paragraph in the appendix that says user-friendly passwords. And um, it just provides, it says that an algorithm ideally should make passwords that are easy to remember. Before the turn of the century, like late 90s, there's some important work that starts to merge human and computer interaction um, with some security things. So two big examples are Witten and Tiger. They, their paper, Why Johnny Can't Encrypt. This is about why people could not um, figure out how to use encrypted emails. And there's also um, a paper that comes out that really emphasizes that users are not the enemy here. They're trying, but you know, not always getting things right. And so these two papers came out in 1999, um, but there was also a lot of work on human-computer interaction before then. Um, there's a very popular conference called CHI. It's you know, one of the top conferences for human and computer interaction. But back in 1982, they were doing a lot with user interfaces and not necessarily security. Um, I was looking at their program, and one topic from 1982 was windowing versus scrolling on a visual display terminal. So not really usable security as we would think of it. But after, after some of those uh, big papers, we have an explosion of usable passwords research. This is by no means an exhaustive representation, and there's even some great work by people here in the audience that I've shown up here. And they, this work looks at questions like, how do you choose, how do users choose passwords? Uh, what kinds of things do they think are strong passwords? How do we give users good advice about picking passwords, and how do we show them password strength meters that work well. But a lot of this is focused on one person, helping one person make a single password. So here we are in 2018, you're creating an account, and you might see something like this. It emphasizes that you should have a password of a certain strength using like a, how long it is. Um, but I want to suggest that there's something else that we also really need to consider, and that's making your password unique. So yes, there's, we've had lots of great work about one password, but what about the usability of maintaining many passwords? As a room of experts, it might be easy for us, but uh, let's be real, people have hundreds of different accounts. Um, one study, one estimate in 20, 2007, found that people on average had 25 password protected accounts. And this number has, I'm sure, only increased since then. Another study in 2014 found that about half of users were reusing their password. And so what does this mean? Well, there's lots and lots of reused passwords out there. As most of you know, password reuse is something that's really easy to exploit. I'll give you a familiar example, but if this is background to you, let it be known that I'm following the kitten rule. Um, so here's your cute kitten picture, if this is background. 
Um, but also, like, it's really hard to find unique pictures of kittens, so I'm just going to reuse this one. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so account, uh, consider an account provider called AcmeCo. Um, they follow best practices, they use a memory hard hash function, they rate limit guessing on their site, they also provide a good password strength meter with advice, um, but does this protect all of Acmeco's accounts? No, because maintaining many passwords is hard. And so if we think about Jim, maybe Jim has an account with Acmeco, but he also has an account with LinkedIn. LinkedIn was breached in 2012, they used the FASH the fast SHA-1 hash function, attackers stole 160 million credentials, and they were able to crack nearly all of the passwords. It's just a matter of time. So back to Acmeco. No matter what security measures they took, if Jim reused his passwords on Acmeco and on LinkedIn, it only takes one guess for an attacker to get into Acmeco. It doesn't matter what security uh, measures they took. So because attackers are going to come, it's only a matter of time, some proactive companies with lots of resources monitor the black market. Uh, Facebook is one example. They, they've been doing this for years. They go on the black market. They look for breach credentials and look for matches within their own database. Now, in such cases, they take action. And if they find a match, they'll force their users to reset their passwords. But when you do this, you have to explain this to users. You have to send them a notification and, un and you know, explain what's going on. This is a notification from Facebook, for example, and it tells you that your Facebook password matches one that was stolen from another site and then goes on to tell you what you should do about it. Um, this was actually an example that we found out about through Twitter because people were discussing this notification and they were confused. They didn't, normal users didn't understand how another site got their Facebook password, um, and they didn't realize that it was because they just reused the password in both places. They were like, why, why are they sharing my passwords? Like, what's going on here? This is really sketchy. And so this, if this is really complicated, um, password reuse notifications as a whole are really, really, oh, are really, really complicated. Surprisingly, no one has looked at password reuse notifications. And so we scoured the internet looking on social media and security blogs, among other places, and we found 24 legitimate password reuse notifications. We define a password reuse notification as one that companies send in situations that may have been caused by password reuse because they don't always explicitly mention password reuse as a cause of this notification, but it definitely could be. And across these 24 notifications, they're all very different. They differ in how they explain the issue, in, how, in what they suggest that people do in reaction to this, um, to this situation, and even in the context that they give, because some mention password reuse and some don't. We looked at all of these notifications in a paper that we completed earlier this year. This is at CCS. And so now I want to highlight some of the results from this paper about the usability of password reuse notifications. As we do in academia, we conducted user research. We surveyed some people. So in study one, we surveyed 180 respondents about previously sent password reuse notifications. And then in study two, we asked 588 respondents about individual components of um, a password reuse notification. But I'm going to focus on study one for today. And in study one, we narrowed down the notifications that we found from all 24 to six representative ones. So these were ones that we felt pretty much represented what was out there in terms of what companies were sending. Um, these six were from LinkedIn, Netflix, Instagram, Facebook, and we had two from Google. We asked users, to, or our respondents, to describe all of the factors that may have led to you receiving this notification. Uh, this is what they said. 60% said it was probably a hacked account. And then 21% said that it may have been because of a data breach. And so while these could be the case, and you know, depending on the situation, um, they didn't voluntarily say it could have been because of password reuse. So how many did list password reuse? Well, it depends. Um, looking at the different notifications, four of them don't mention password reuse at all. And so for, these, for respondents who saw this notification, essentially none of them were able to name password reuse as a cause. For the two notifications that do kind of allude to password reuse and say that you know, 
there, there was some password that was similar, about half of respondents were able to name password reuse as a cause. But this raises the question of like, why didn't everyone name password reuse? Uh, why didn't more, at least more than half? And so if we look back at some of these notifications, um, as security experts, maybe we can read this and say, keep your account secure. Because of automated checks, we found out that there was password reuse, blah, 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 like, you know, change your password. Um, but if we look really closely at the wording, it says, the password you use for Instagram is the same as one that was stolen from another site. One that was like a pa one password that was stolen, but like they don't say whether it was my password, whether it was someone else's password, whose password was stolen, and it doesn't really name um, users in reusing passwords. And we didn't find any notifications that do this explicitly. Um, this might be because companies are reluctant to blame users, and that's totally valid, but this also prevents users from fully mitigating the situation because they don't understand what's going on. So we've, you know, in the past, there's been research about how users understand passwords, the strength of one password, but not necessarily the strength of their passwords as a whole, you know, across the internet, across all of the accounts that they have. When we asked respondents why they wouldn't choose unique passwords, this is one quote from respondent 171. They said, the chances of someone guessing that I use the same password are still incredibly low. Now, to parallel this to like the single password use case, this would be like someone saying, the chances of someone guessing that I use password as my password are really low, right? And so we can um, come up with reasons why this, this is incorrect. And that reason is essentially lots of other people also use password as your password, and so that's why you shouldn't do it. But to go back to respondent 171, if you break it down, what does it take to understand that this is incorrect? It takes much more than one reason. So you do have to understand that lots of other people reuse passwords and maybe use passwords like you do, um, but you also have to have some knowledge of the black market. You have to have knowledge that there are breach credentials out there, and there are millions, billions of credentials I think many users would not be thinking about that huge scale. Um, you would also have to understand automation, how attackers are able to guess passwords really quickly, and how they can use all sorts of mingling to you know, create these um, passwords that are similar, but not necessarily exactly the same, which is how people reuse passwords, and you know, all sorts of other complicated technical things that a normal user might not be thinking about. So, Understanding why password reuse is bad, this is a really hard concept, I think, for users to understand. As we've seen, evaluating the usability of many passwords is really different than evaluating the usability of a single password. So now I want to switch gears really quick and uh, present briefly on a related project. Um, this was about password reuse by multiple users within a single service, so moving from um, when one user reuses multiple passwords. Uh, this is the talk that Cecilia mentioned earlier today, so thank you for the shout out, and I can give you a quick summary of some of the things we found here. So in this work, we looked at how passwords are related to the service that they're created for, because ultimately, passwords are created for an account. They're created for some kind of purpose, right? Like, I mean, maybe some people in this room might, but most people are not creating passwords for the sake of creating passwords. Authentication is a means to an end. So if you take the example of myappletrees.com, you could guess that someone creates a password like myappletrees.password. Um, you could also guess things like red delicious or like different types of apples or fruits or trees, you know, things that are related to what this service provides. And for anyone here who cracks passwords, you probably know this intuitively, but we wanted to get more information about it, um, you know, research, gain a deeper manual understanding of what this means. So we chose five password leaks uh, to look at. The first was Battlefield Heroes, which is a third-person shooter game. Browsers, a adult porn company. Um, Last FM, which is free music streaming. LinkedIn for so, uh, professional social networking, and Mate One, which is an online dating site. Um, from these five leaks, we selected the top 1,000 and did some filtering, and I did a lot of manual qualitative coding to see what we would find across these passwords. So we found that, yes, passwords are related to the name of the account that they were created for, 
um, when we rank them by the most frequent, and let's just look at the top 10 for each service, four out of the five are just you know, straight up the name of the, of the account or of the service. And for mate one, it's like the second one. For some reason, sexy was the first password um, that people wanted to use for their mate one password. And anywhere from one to six of the top 10 passwords are related to the name of the service, and that's what we found. We also found that passwords are related to the topic of the service. So for example, Battlefield Heroes is a third person shooter game, and so a lot of these passwords are related to what you might be doing in the game. Browsers as a porn company, you will see porn in the password. That makes sense? And LinkedIn, you see a lot of passwords related to what people are doing on LinkedIn. You know, networking, job searching, this makes sense. It's pretty intuitive. And we also found that users are inclined to choose passwords for similar interests. So beyond the specific topic of the site that they created it for, other interests that they might have. Um, so Battlefield Heroes again, we found a lot of passwords relating to other games or other consoles, even ViewSonic, like the monitor, which is very interesting. Um, for browsers, there were a lot of passwords related to sports and cars. Sorry, Pear. It's sports and cars, but this is like related to passwords. So we found that a lot of the reused pass or yeah, reused passwords in browsers across different users were related to sports and cars because that's I guess what they liked. And we also found that passwords reflected international backgrounds, depending on the service that they were, what service they were created for. So Battlefield Heroes was created by EA Dice, which is a Swedish company. And so there were Swedish words in the passwords. Um, there was also Dutch words like your mom, password in Dutch, and Panzer in German, um, a German tank. And you know this could be because if the company is based in Western Europe, then the user bases are very likely to be Western European. Mate one, like many dating services, can be frequented by foreign scammers, which could explain why there were many names in Yoruba, which is a Nigerian language that were in the passwords. And lastly, we found that users invoked religion a lot when it came to making passwords for jobs or love. So in LinkedIn, there were passwords you know, to deities of various religions and you know, proclaiming that God is great, maybe so they can you know, be lucky when they try and find a job. And similarly, in Mate 1, people are thinking about their religion uh, my favorite is God help me. <laughs> God help me find a mate, I guess. Very funny. Lots of people taking pictures of this. Okay, so coming up with unique passwords is hard. Users are told to make a memorable password, but there's like really a finite set of what can be memorable for most people. And so when you have to come up with a password that is unique, even if you think it's unique, it's likely, highly likely to be similar to what other people are choosing. And so this is also another form of password reuse. So in conclusion, there are key usability challenges that are unique to password reuse. And taking a step back, why, why is that? Well, if we go back to Acmeco, they're just one service and they want to protect their users from password reuse. But they don't know where passwords came from. The breach passwords could come from any number of different services. And so really, this is an ecosystem level problem. It can't be solved by one service because one service doesn't know all of the passwords of all of the users. So maybe other parts of the ecosystem could have more visibility into this issue, like password managers or web browsers, because they sometimes do have visibility into what users are setting as their password when they're creating their accounts. And that's really a crucial time for, you know, to make some changes. In future work, I'd like to see systems that guide users to not reusing passwords and kind of make it difficult for them to do so. Um, Looking at one password in macOS, unfortunately, like the way that these are implemented, you kind of have to dig around to figure out whether you're reusing passwords. It, you know, there's a tiny duplicate sign, there's some warning symbols, and at the bottom it says this is a reused password, and so I guess you shouldn't do that. But it's not explicitly preventing you from reusing a password. Um, and so users are basically, they're allowed to reuse passwords, and there's a question of whether or not they should be able to do that. Um, there's a cool new academic proposal 
um, and this is, proposes a way to check whether passwords were reused. Uh, this paper will be presented in a few months at uh, NDSS in February. And this system is supposed to be crypt cryptographically secure and maintain everyone's uh, password strength while not compromising security and you know, checking for reused passwords. So we found that users often get a lot of crap. I mean, this is true. They get called the problem between the chair and the keyboard, ID10. T error, I mean, I'm sure you're all familiar with this, um, but ultimately, if we look at these systems, how usable these systems are depends on the implementation. It's not up to the users because users are not managing the systems that they use. So I've argued that there are key usability challenges that are unique to password reuse, and ultimately, usability depends on everything but the user. Thank you.